Hello. Hi there. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Um, today's webinar topic is uh, uh, the gray way understanding the African gray parrot. And um, I, I will give us a little bit of time for people to log in. And so we got a few poll questions for you while we wait, give people a chance um, to get logged in. And here we go. I'm going to launch. Um, I'm going to launch our poll questions. The first one is the question is, um, what subspecies of African gray do you have? And the choices are Timna or Congo. Oh, wow. People are just, <laughs> I guess the numbers go away. <laughs> um, so Lisa, uh, while we look at this question, if you don't mind, um, you want a, a brief di difference between the two. I know that there's a size difference, a color difference, and it looks like so far, a lot of people have, a lot more people have a Congo gray than a Timna gray. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I have a couple slides that we're going to go over. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll stay um, tuned for that then. Oh, we'll hold off. Okay. That so um, for those that are just joining us, so we have a poll question on what type of gray do you have? And it uh, looks like 84% uh, of respondents have Congo grays and 16% have Timna grays. Does that surprise you? Just wonder? No. no? no. Okay. Yeah, I, I, figured, uh, I, I figured it would lean towards Congos a little bit as well. Um, that's good. You see more of those in the pet trade. Okay. Okay. People tend to go more for the larger, brighter colors yeah. of the Congo versus the Timna. Okay. So yeah, it looks like we are 17% uh, of our viewers today have a Timna and 83% have a Congo African gray. Um, so I'm going to give it another few seconds and that is the end of that poll. There we go. I'm going to share the results. Do, do, do. It is 17% Timna and 83% Congo. Um, see, I thought I had another bull Russian, um, but it's just not showing up. Okay. All right. Well, there we go. Okay. Uh, that's our poll question for today. <laughs> uh, I think, well, we're going to have so many questions about, uh, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of feedback from our, from our viewers today. So why don't we go ahead a uh, couple minutes in now, we'll let people, uh, uh, they, can, they can join us as they do. Uh, I'm going to let you take it away um, in, a, in a little bit, Lisa. So just as a quick intro, if you're just joining us, uh, welcome to the webinar. My name is Laura Doreen. I'm going to be your host today. And um, our topic is the gray way, understanding the African gray parrot. And our special guest is Lisa Bono. Um, she is the owner and operator of the Platinum Parrot and a certified parrot behavioral consultant specializing in African gray parrots. So Lisa, welcome. And um, I am going to let you go ahead and take it away. Let's, let's okay. talk about the African gray. All right. Thank you everybody for joining in. I see a lot of people sending chats and saying hello and I recognize the names and I'm very thankful you joined in. This is Sam, just in case you, if I start talking to her. Um, she is my latest rehome and she is an absolute doll. So I figured hopefully if we need any examples we could use her and she'll cooperate. Um, so I'm going to start, we're actually, we're going to do a PowerPoint and it's going to just be a general uh, little bit about grays and there's a lot of different things that we can uh, go over um, if we decide to do another webinar, if you guys want to touch some more on different topics. So let me get that going. And if you hear mumbling, it is not me, it is Sam. Okay. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's a little bit about an African gray. This is a painting that was actually won by um, me at a fundraiser for the Alex Foundation. She was asking for water. Okay, so um, I want to go over first off the general area of where African grays come from in Africa. So you'll see that the Timna has a smaller range, the Congo is more in the middle. Um, there are really only two 
subspecies, you're going to see over here on this next slide, um, you're going to see the ones in red. The red highlighted ones are going to be ones that you will hear people say, I have a Cameroon gray or I have a Tago gray. Actually, that is simply the region in Africa where they come from. Uh, there is really no such thing. Yes, there are maybe a little bit lighter or a little bit bigger. Again, that comes from the different areas in Africa. The um, Cameroon grays tend to be, or the Cameroon area tend to be a little bit larger and lighter than some of the other, but there is no designated recognized Cameroon African gray. This is um, a little bit about them, and you will see that the only two that are recognized in agriculture are going to be the Congo gray and the Timna gray. These are some rather important dates that you guys should always keep in mind, considering that you um, do have these species. First, in 1992, um, they stopped importation of African grays into the United States. Uh, in 2012, a bunch of scientists got together and agreed that actually these animals are very sentient beings, as you already know, but now we have the proof. In 16, they, CITES put them on the Appendix 2 list, which means they were watched uh, being um, traded in other countries. They still did a lot of trading. There's still a lot of uh, sad illegal trading going on. And in 2018, they were moved up to the Appendix 1 list where there's not supposed to be any trading. And this is from the World Parrot Trust. They finally closed the loopholes and there's no legal international trade of wild gray parrots. It does happen, there are poachers, but we're working the best we can to protect them in the wild. We're gonna start out with some of the Timna grays. Um, my first African gray was actually a Timna. I find them absolutely adorable. Some of the markers for them are going to be this little Mr. Rogers sweater vest they have going on here with the darker neck down into the chest and the abdomen is the lighter gray. You can see that pretty much on all of them. The horn beak and if you look down here you will see the tail is usually darker and um, all the birds you're going to see featured on here are actually from my African gray page. So that's why all their names are here and thank you for everybody for sharing. You'll see little Max's face down here because I thought it was rude, I just showed his butt. But it gives you a general idea of what they look like. They're overly a little smaller than the Congo Grays, but you have a lot of people who aren't even really sure which type of African Gray they have. So that's why I wanted to go over that a little bit. Going into the Congos, um, they're gonna have the darker beak. They don't have that sweater vest look going on there. They have a little bit more scallops and they're more uniform. Um, you can see that some of them appear a little bit lighter in color. That could be also from the lighting, but you do have lighter grays, like Sam is very light on my shoulder, and then you have darker grays. My Sydney is very dark. So um, the bright red tail, and the beak and overall larger in size. These happen to be the mo more popular grays that you see. And people go for the flashier tail. They mm -hmm. think that there is some difference between intellect. There's, there's really not. The Tinnas and Congos are both incredibly smart and have the ability to talk and um, you know, there's, there's no difference. Um, with the babies, this is kind of important because a lot of people don't know this. Um, when we get them from a pet store, hopefully a very good breeder, we take them home and we put them in our homes. In the wild, the Congos will stay with their family units for up to 18 months. In those 18 months, the parents are teaching them 
to you, where to fly, what to eat, what to be afraid of, what you know, what's safe. Um, the timnas tend to mature a little bit quicker. They say about six months. Um, I would think it's a little bit longer, but the Congos are 18 months. Um, when we bring them in our homes, we just kind of expect them to be a bird. Um, they, we don't understand that we have to teach them. We have to guide them and steward good behavior, good nutrition, and teach them. So a lot of people will say, yeah, I brought home a toy and the bird's afraid. Well, that's because the bird doesn't know what it is. Or the bird doesn't eat this type of food. The bird doesn't know what it is. So if you're offering a new food, what I would suggest is to act like you're eating it yourself. Make it special. Make it fun. Let them see you eating or pretend to be eating it. And then hand it to them. And this way you're teaching them that's what you're supposed to be doing with it. They don't know if that's you know, you know, a piece of wood or a piece of leather, they can't eat that. So you have to kind of guide them along the way. The different things that make African grays so special, or actually parrots in general, this is just a pretty much general guide. Um, you can find this online anywhere. Um, and it'll give you a good idea and you should know these things for if you have to go to the vet. Um, you should have a general idea of what all these things are so you can actually talk with your vet about this kind of stuff. All right. What makes them special are birds have a series of air sacs compared to humans where we only have our lungs. This makes them able to fly and be able to breathe um, much better and more efficient. Um, so that's something they have that we don't. They have the zygodactyl's foot. I know I'm saying that probably wrong. Um, it's because <laughs> Sam, just, Sam just pooped on me. <laughs> um, they have uh, two toes forward and two toes back. Um, most birds have three forward and one back, as I'm sure you see by watching them in the wild. But this is what kind of sets the parrot family apart. As far as perching, when you're looking to find perches, you want different various sizes and textures for parrot foot health. Um, I always tell people I want to see them get perches that the birds can get about their toes about three quarters of the way around. This way they can have good grip. If it's too large like this, um, it's kind of like standing on a balance beam. And too small like this is like us putting our foot in a very tiny little shoe. So in order to make sure we don't end up with sores on their feet or problems with their toes, you want to make sure varied product, varied sizes, but you want to stick with something like this. You don't want to have something that's four inches uh, round and expect a Tim the Gray to be able to walk safely. What are you doing? Okay. Um, next one is the nicotating membrane. Um, some people have seen this. The birds actually have a third eyelid, uh, eyelid. And this helps when they are flying to keep debris out of their eyes. Obviously, we don't have that. Um, I believe it comes down this way and back up. Uh, that I should have looked up beforehand, but I always can. Um, so that is something they have that we don't. Uh, and then this is something you guys are familiar with, powder down feathers. African grays are very dusty. Um, reason being is because the powder down feathers, the way they grow, the way they disintegrate. Um, this is when a powder down feather is growing in, this is how it comes in. And it's usually like a hard white case and it starts to unravel down at the end. Um, I've had people ask me if their birds had worms because they did not realize this was a feather that was growing in. Okay, this is what they look out look like when they're randomly floating around our house. Um, the animal was just too cute. And this is the result of them disintegrating. That is the dust and dander from my air purifier. Um, with five grays, I have to keep one running all the time. 
the thing you should know is a dusty gray is a healthy gray. So while we really don't necessarily want to be breathing in all this stuff, if you have a gray that's possibly not producing a lot of powder down, it's something you may want to speak to with your veterinarian um, because there could be issues for them not producing it. Timnus do not seem to be as dusty as the Congos. Maybe that's why their feathers look a little bit lighter, but that's something to keep in mind. They also have a preen gland. This, this gland on the gray is gonna be larger than most species. Um, it's gonna be heart-shaped and above the tail. And this is actually my Sydney after he had surgery. He had a blocked preen gland, so that's why he's plucked around there. Um, he just came out of surgery and we took pictures specifically for this. So this helps keep their feathers um, oiled up, waterproof, and safe. Vocalization. A lot of people get African greys because they speak, but not all birds are going to talk. Um, I have two that do not. Uh, they don't talk like us. They don't have a voice box. Uh, they speak from the larynx, and the spharynx is what works together to make the noises and the words. Okay. So this is little Emma over here. She happens to be one of mine that don't speak, but know that even if they don't ever utter a word, they can communicate with you through body language. I am very aware with Emma's screams when my husband gets up off the couch or when he's walking in the backyard. She has two distinct screams. I don't even need to look because I know where he is. She's my little tattletale. <laughs> Vision is very different. A lot of people don't seem to uh, know this. Um, you'll see a lot of times if you are flustered and you go up to your African gray, um, or maybe you just happen to have an argument with somebody or things aren't going your way and you walk in and, you know, you know that you're flustered, the capillaries in your face are a little bit, you know, pinker than normal. Your birds are seeing you in a different way. You don't appear normal. So they have, they can see an ultraviolet range. So while we see the human vision, and that's the typical bird, that's what they see in the bird vision. That'll help determine um, boys versus girls. It'll also help determine what fruits are ripe instead of flying down and testing every single banana on the tree. They can tell which one to go in, get it, and get out. Some common concerns that I often see on the page and have heard through uh, heard from clients through the years. Beak issues. Um, they aren't normally just shiny and dark black. But you're always going to have some sort of flaking and peeling. They're like a fingernail. They, they're comprised of layers. Um, with them chewing on stuff and wiping on the beat the, the perches, you're gonna have like the middle picture there, uh, Winston. You're gonna normally see stuff like that. Um, you know, they'll clean it up a little bit more. Some people put oils on, I don't specifically not, but um, Winston's owner reached out to us in regards to his beak because the first picture is what it looked like and she thought maybe it was cracked. And that's probably because he wasn't grooming it himself. So. They went to the vet and he got a nice little beak trim and he looks really good. Um, now, I don't know if you could see up in the right hand corner. I can't really see everything because it's blocked, but you'll see a black tip of a beak. That is Sydney's beak. Up in the very corner in the gray, if you could see it, that is a piece of beak in my hand. Again, it's the tip. The bottom picture is Sydney after he broke it and all that red is blood. There's a blood supply in there and if they land hard on the floor, or land in properly and hit their beak, they can certainly break it off. Um, 
if you, you should always have some sort of cornstarch. That's what I like to use in the house because it's not caustic. They can, they can get it in their mouth. Um, it's not gonna bother them. You could try that. And I always urge you to reach out to your veterinarian because if it continues to bleed, then they, it might need to be cauterized. Luckily, Sydney stopped. It's grown in and now we've had to put rugs down to prevent him from landing on the hardwood floor. Lisa, can I uh, just interrupt real quick? So the beak is a, um, it's a, it could be a very sensitive area on a bird. So a, you'd want a vet to take a look at if there's any beak trim involved, right? You don't want to, it's yeah. not like trimming your fingernail at no. the end. It's very yeah. different, right? Correct. Um, I've had birds for 42 years. I don't trim beaks. Um, because, it, you know, there are a lot of nerve endings in there, and if you do it improperly, you can cause beak rot. If you cut it too short, it's like breaking your fingernail down the middle of the bed. Um, it's going to hurt. If they break their beak, it's going to hurt. So that's why you should contact the vet, because they might need Medicam. Um, they might need an, a, a pain medication. Um, and they're also going to need soft foods. So... It's usually a good idea to keep some sort of baby food in the house, whether it's a high quality hand feeding formula or something soft that it won't bother them when they're eating. I always keep baby food in the house, nothing with meat, um, you know, just the veggies, the sweet potatoes, just in case it's, you know, kind of an insurance policy, it's policy of 89 cents, just in case I need it. Um, during this whole pandemic, I think I've been out five times since February. Twice have been to the, either to the veterinarian or to the food store for baby food because Sydney broke his beak. Average weights. They can really vary a lot. Um, I've had a lot of people say the bird is fat, you know, it's overweight. Um, they range so greatly. You can see by the little chart on top, that's going to be from Dr. Scott McDonald. He is board certified. Um, the visits is going to be how many visits into the office for, for that species. The, the weight mean is just the medium weight for them. Uh, but what he's seen, the range can range 20% in either way. And over in the corner, um, I'm sorry, I should have made this a little smaller. Um, the average, uh, the highest weight he's recorded for each species. So, I can tell you that Otis was my first Timna African Gray. He was 352 grams, which he was pretty big. And I didn't realize at the time that he was such a big Gray. Now, with my Congos, my smallest one is Emma, and she's 374 grams. And my largest Congo was Samson Bell, and he was 680 grams. None of them were overweight. None of them were underweight. They were good for their body size. And just like us, they vary. So that's why you work with your vet, um, see if you can get a baseline, and you want to try to keep it around that. If you see that it's going down, if you ha you should invest in a scale. If you see it's going down, you need to contact your vet. Uh, know that morning poops can really take some grams off there in the morning. So you want to try to weigh them the same time each day and allow for that morning holding poop um, to average it out. You're going to see over here Molly. If you're able to see him, he really doesn't weigh zero. Uh, his, his caregiver told me that he's about 279 grams, but you can see Tika is pretty big at 538. Um, Isabel's 284. And then you have Alex and I'm not sure who he is, uh, cause I didn't have a name, but they're in the four ranges. Um, the majority of my grays are going to be the mid fours right now, except for Emma, but she's a little petite, tiny girl. The discoloration of feathers. Um, the first picture you're gonna see there, that's Sydney when he was a baby. You can see that he just looks normal. Um, around his vent and on his legs, he does have a tinge of pink, but that is a very baby picture. You can tell by his tail, because it still has the um, darkish edging on it. Now, 
the middle picture is Sydney, the way he usually looks at me. He, he usually has a little bit of an attitude. Um, he plucks around his neck. He has separation anxiety issues, and uh, we also believe he has a little ADHD. So um, he does pluck around his neck, and his feathers started to come in red. The last picture is also Sydney, um, obviously in a good mood there. And you can see that he has some on his abdomen. He does not pick there. So I do know his parents are red factors. Um, they had a lot of extra red feathers in them. So he has a combination of two things grow going on. As they grow in, he's getting more red. As he plucks a certain area, he's getting more red. Um, and he has the genetics as well. And they have been noticed in the wild to have the red feathers or red ticking um, because in the wild, they're actually the natives um, consider them uh, king Congos because of the coloration. There could be other issues going on. Um, if you have red feathers coming in, if you see other issues with the eyes are getting more yellow or anything like that, I'm the first one to always tell you, talk to your vet. Feather destructive behavior. Sadly, this is an issue with a lot of birds. And I could tell you, three of my birds are pictured on here. Um, all of my birds have the same cages, the same food, the same toys, the same play stand. I have five little tape recorders that have the same exact thing. However, um, I do have three pluckers. Now, Sam is perfect. Um, and considering her history um, with some medical issues she had way in the back, you would think she would be naked, but she is gorgeous. You have Sydney pictured there. So you could see around his neck, he, he is plucking. You have Sterling there, that's my other one. He uh, is actually 39 and he has a lot of hormones going on because we have three very pretty girls in the room with him and then it's him and Sydney. Um, so we know that's hormonal. Sometimes he lets all his feathers grow in and he's absolutely gorgeous. And next day, he can look like, you know, that again. Um, and then you have my Otis down here in the very corner. Um, know that he had medical issues. He ended up having liver issues. So that's sadly how I learned that way. So I never want an owner to think that because they're birds plucking, they're doing something wrong. That's not the case. The bird could be bored. There could be environmental things going on. It could be um, medical and it could be genetics. We're learning also that it's genetics. So he can have the best food, the best of everything, treated like a king and he still might pluck. So, you know, we have to try to work through that and realize that um, I personally would have rather have a bird that plucks, that's alive and with me, than a bird that has every single feather gorgeously in place that's dead. And that happened with me with my Samson. You would never know there was anything in the world wrong with him, not a feather out of place, and he died. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but again, I don't want any owner to ever think they did something wrong. If you have any issues like this, again, your vet. Okay. Um, this was, these, this feathers, these, they're from my house. That was Sydney one day. Um, not exactly sure what happened. He might've seen something outside his window. I was just as shocked as he was. He could have fell and maybe hurt himself and then went to town because it looks like you have some red feathers on there. It looks like some dent feathers. Um, so they can, if, if they are plucking and they're not looked at by the vet, they can move on to mutilating and chewing of the skin. So you have to keep an eye on that and have a good working relationship with your avian vet.
because it's one of the most important relationships you are going to have while you have your bird. Oops. Okay, now we're gonna talk about general necessities. And again, this can all go into different webinars if people are interested, it's just a quick review. Housing. Um, a lot of people say bigger is better, and yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that most times, but know that African greys really like wider cages than taller cages, so keep that in mind when you're buying. The smallest cage I have is for Emma, up there in the top, uh, top left. Um, that is 32 by 24. And the reason I have her a little bit smaller is because she has a twisted neck. I don't want her falling and hurting herself when she falls. Um, the other cages all are about 30, 34 by 20, no, 36 by 24-ish. When you get to the larger cages, you get to the longer cages. They're really meant for macaws um, with long tails. So if that's an option you are looking for, just make sure the bar spacing is correct. You want about an inch. Anything smaller than that, they can get their wings caught in. Any larger than that, you know, you don't want them getting anything else caught, you know, thinking that they can get out or their shoulder or something like that. So just keep that in mind as a general rule. Watch the bar spacing. Okay, now we're going to toys. Um, because I own a pet store, a lot of experience in this avenue. Grays like toys they can destroy. Um, if you get something in the very top, you're gonna see Taco. If you look at his one toy in the background there, you have a, a little block there, you have some beads. Um, those are kind of uh, useless for a gray. They're really too tough and too big for them to get their beak around. So you'll realize that they're gonna last a long time. That's because they can't chew on it. They really like softer woods. Um, up in the right-hand corner, you're gonna see some balsa. Um, you, there's a pinata hiding under there, and there's also some soft pine hiding under there. Um, those tend to be a favorite. When you're picking out toys, you wanna make sure you really don't get more or wider than an inch, all right? Because it's like us trying to eat a Big Mac. Um, they need to get their beak around it. If it's too hard, they're gonna walk away from it. And then, because they're bored, they're, they might go to feather destruction or they can go to home destruction or doing other behavior things that, you know, you, you're not necessarily gonna like. So you wanna try to keep them busy. Um, a busy beak is a quiet beak. You're preventing bad behavior right there um, by offering them proper things. They love birdie bagels. They usually love pinata type things, shredding, cardboard. Uh, they do like acrylic, believe it or not. I think it's, it's the colors. You'll see a little rattle foot toy up there. Um, I've sent them to a lot of customers because, you know, the birds just love the, especially the translucent colors. Um, if you're looking at beads, the plastic or the acrylic ones are okay, um, but the wooden ones are just going to be too tough. Um, you know, there's some toys you can put birdie bagels on. If you get a skewer, you can make your own. Uh, they don't always have to be big, expensive toys. You want the right toys that they're going to play with. That's going to help them keep their beak in shape. Grays are usually love their foot toys. Um, we do have some exceptions, but keep that in mind when you're looking. When you're out at a pet store, you're gonna take your thumb and you're gonna push your thumbnail into the piece of wood to see how uh, tough the wood is. If you can't make an indent, it's gonna be too tough for your bird. If you can leave a little, little indentation and it's about an inch wide, you're, you're probably good to go. If you don't give them the correct stuff, this is what's going to kind of happen. They're going to find other things to keep them busy. Um, they don't sit in a while. They go every you know, minute they're awake. Recreation centers. Um, there are a lot of different things you could do. There's simple PVC ones that you could do. Um, 
when you're trying to pick one out, you want to make sure that it doesn't really have legs on it if you're trying to keep your bird up because they just ship it down the leg. So it's kind of defeating the purpose. So if you, in the top left, you can see a bunch of trees. That's actually my bird room. Um, and those are my birds. As you can see, we have five trees there. Everybody has to have a tree. Um, and you know, while there are, they are an invest, investment, they last a really long time. You wanna make sure you get about an inch uh, circumference for the perches again, because they're gonna be moving around. Now there was a time where I really couldn't have, I didn't have the room, nor did I have funds to have trees. So you can see in the bottom, you, there are ropes that are hanging from the ceiling. They're called boings. Not all boings are created equal. Um, there's an excellent company that I deal with that hand makes these boings and they're very heavy duty. Uh, with a cockatoo, if you get a normal boing, the boing bounces when the bird gets on there. Cockatoos love that. They love the animation. Grays don't. They're gonna be scared. They're never gonna go near it again. So these have a wider and thicker wire inside, so they don't bounce, but they will swing. And when you're trying to introduce it, you hold the bottom of the boing, and then you put the bird on it so it's not moving, and then eventually you can let the bottom go. All right. That bottom picture there with the all the grays and the Kayik and the Amazon, that was my house. That was what I had as a recreational center. It worked. And in the corner, you can see my Samson. That's the only play center he had. Um, it's a good investment to give them their own area to come out, reward to come out, have fun, and it's their spot. Okay. Um, lighting is very important for these guys with vitamin D. Best way to get vitamin D is if you can take them outside securely. Um, a lot of people take them out unsecure, just on their hand or on their shoulder like Sam is, and then they never see the bird again. Um, so there are options of a harness. A harness is a great way to take them out, but don't ever leave them by themselves and watch those hawks because they are out there. So make sure if you're taking them out, I always have mine right here by my chest. So this way, you know, if a hawk does come down, chances are he's hopefully gonna get me instead of the bird. Um, there are travel cages. There are little, you know, little rolling cages, um, but that is gonna be the best. The birds need to have vitamin D. Uh, windows in houses that were made after 1974 have um, the, have a coating on it that blocks the beneficial rays that our birds need. So if you need to, to add something to your environment, there are options with lighting. So keep that in mind. African grays really need this, and it doesn't matter whether it's a Congo or Tinda, they really need it more than any other species. Not having enough vitamin D in their body can lead to a lot of different issues. Healthy diet. So of course, again, people think that birds won't eat or the birds don't like it. Well, it's be usually because their birds don't recognize it as food. Don't give up. There's a lot of different healthy things here. Sweet potatoes tend to be a, a favorite. You can see we have a couple Nutri berries in here. Um, you know, a lot of different, the darker veggies are gonna be the healthier veggies, the oranges, the reds, the dark greens, your uh, lettuces and stuff like that, the light, the cucumber, that, that really doesn't have any much nutrition in it. So try to stay with the darker stuff and make sure before you go and give your bird something that you make sure it's on the safe list. There's quite a few things that you don't want to give your bird. I'm sure you know, but it's like avocado and onions and garlic and stuff like that. And there's a lot of different websites out there that will help you to keep you away from that stuff. One favorite is usually pomegranates. And as you can see, we have a bunch of pumpkin lovers here. So try that come, come the fall. Bathing is very important for these guys. A lot of people have issues trying to get their guys in the bath. Um, each one's an individual. Now, Sundays here is a day where everybody 
gets a bowl in their cage, as you can see by Abby. They all get a bowl in their cage. If they don't, some of them like ice in the water, just a couple ice cubes, other ones won't. It's kind of like, you know, everybody's got to do their own thing. Um, I, if they won't go in it, I'll play the music and put the vacuum cleaner on. Usually they jump right in. Some prefer it in their, in their food bowl. Um, Sterling, as you can see in the corner, that was one of my bird rooms. He likes, uh, he likes to go in the, in the sink. And then Tiki here is in the shower. So don't give up, keep trying. Um, this is one of my favorite slides. Um, they need 10 to 12 hours of sleep each night. Um, and remember, Edgar's telling you that. This is my bird room. These are my girls getting ready to go sleepy. Um, it's a separate room. I'm, I'm fortunate that it's just my husband and I in the house. So, you know, we have a spare room. They're able to go in there. I can keep it quiet, uninterrupted sleep, 10 to 12 hours. They wake up much better mood and well rested, just like I do if I got that amount of sleep. So all of this uh, will help you achieve optimum health and stunning appearance. You got to admit, all those grays right there are, are gorgeous. But no, there's a lot of special able birds out there that are just as gorgeous. So if you ever get a chance to open your hearts to one that needs you, please consider it because I really do think that they know you're helping them. And as you could see, they're all just as gorgeous. None, no two are alike. They have their own personalities. You can tell by all these guys here, they all have something different on their mind. So if you have more than one, don't think that you're gonna have two that are the same or they're gonna like each other. They're all individuals. I'm, I'm sorry, my cell phone's going off. <laughs> sorry. All right, so most times in my house, this is what it feels like, okay? That'd be Miss Abby in the middle there, all right? Um, but these are some of my best teachers through the years. Sydney is going to be 18. Then there's Miss Emma, she's 17. Then you have Sterling, he's 39. He was in my family, he was my father's bird. I grew up with him. Then you have Miss Abigail, um, she's my little tester, she's taught me a lot. Then you have Miss Sam, little quiet one on my shoulder. Um, pretty much the, uh, we bought Sydney. Um, the other ones pretty much came to me a little bit older in life. Um, Sam is 27, Abby I think is 20. Um, up here underneath there, I don't know if anybody can see it. Uh, that's my dad's bird, that's Bubba. I grew up with him. This is my Sam who passed away, gorgeous feather, but died of aspergillosis. And then you have my Otis down here who's, uh, who started this whole thing. Um, wild caught import that was an extremely sweet bird. So this is kind of how I end it. Um, that is my bird room. That is the reason my husband and I moved down here to South Carolina so I can finally, after 40 years, have the bird room of my dreams. So I want to thank everybody for joining in today. And if I have any questions, let me get out of here. Okay. First of all, that is an amazing bird room. <laughs> that's something I would love to aspire to. Like, that's, that's so impressive. And that was... Um, that was truly enlightening. Thank you, Lisa, for walking us through all that. I mean, that even if you, you know, for all parrots, that's just very important information. Um, so we do have a lot of questions, uh, of course. Okay. I think this is a very, very popular, um, very popular topic. And uh, so first off the bat, we have a question from Kenny. And he asks, um, let's see, quasi age 24, presumed male, very healthy, wonderful, friendly bird. He's lived here a little over four years. He came from a good home. Uh, who raised him from a chick. In the past few months, um, he's taken to clearing his crop, like throwing up on various carpets around the house. Uh, looks more like a fen, but it's relatively new behavior. Is this normal or is this healthy? 
Um, if you cut out for a minute, so if I heard you right, this is a new behavior and it usually happens when he's down on the floor on the carpet. Let's see. Um, yeah, it says that in the past few months, he's taking um, a habit of clearing his crop on various uh, carpets around the house. So, okay. Yeah. All right. So we sound like um, he's happy where he's at. He's happy enough that he's wanting to try to make a nest. Okay. He's getting hormonal. And being down on the floor, that's probably what he's looking for. Um, I would suggest, well, yes. Is it a normal behavior? Yes, for a hormonal gray, it's kind of, that's what they do. Um, but we want to try to stop that. And if we can keep him up off the floor and maybe give him other things to do to keep them hormones down because we don't want, to, we don't want him stimulated. We don't want to encourage that because that can lead to medical problems down the road. Okay. Um, and just a reminder to, um, to our participants today, if you have a question, um, if you could please use the uh, Q&A um, button on, and not the chat one. It makes it a little bit easier, um, easier for us to get to your question. And if we don't get your question, then you can, um, we'll have an email answer for you later. So uh, please use the Q&A button. All right, so next question is from Gail. Um, I use full spectrum lights during the day and moonlight at night. Um, is that okay for providing light to my gray? Um, yes, I would probably say about five hours. That's what my veterinarians recommend to me is about five hours a day for the full spectrum. Um, I never really use the moonlight. I know some of the lights do have them. I'm not really sure what the benefits of that is, um, how bright it keeps it. Um, that's probably something I talk to the manufacturer about and see what the benefits of it are versus not having that part of the light on at night. My guys do have a nightlight on, but it's a very subtle nightlight, pretty much so if I have to go in there in the middle of the night, I don't stub my toe. But other than that, I try to keep it as dark <laughs> as possible. <laughs> do, do, cause I, I, from my experience with my cockatiels, they would essentially, uh, occasionally get night frights. Do, do grays, are they prone to night frights or? Not as much. Um, I, I had cockatiels from 1985 to 2007. I don't think I slept one night that the, all those years because of night fright. I had 17 of them. So one starts, they all start. Um, I think in probably the past 20 years, I've had grays maybe four times. And that could have been because we were having a storm or maybe thunder or me bumping into something in the other room. So it's not as common. Okay, thank you. Um, so Tony asks, uh, our gray is scared of the cage, um, which we have kept, let's see, our gray is scared of the cage, which we have uh, kept in front of her for two weeks. We put treats in the cage, but do not know how to desensitize, um, desensitize her. So it sounds like the gray is afraid of the cage that uh, they're trying to get it acclimated to, I'm guessing. Okay, so I, I gather it's a new cage. Um, what I would suggest, if at all possible, is to always take a cage, a new cage, and place it next to the old cage, and slowly start moving their favorite toys in. Um, that's the best way to do it, because again, it's, it, it might be the color. You know, some of these cages come in greens, which are going to be a bright green, and if they had, you know, a beige cage before, this is all scary stuff. So if, you know, you, you, have the old cage next to the new cage, let them go on their, let them go on his own back and forth and slowly move the toys over and start putting his favorite treats inside the cage. Um, that tends to be the best way. I had to do that with Emma because Emma's usually afraid of everything and she's like a little drama queen. She just throws her head back and faints. Um, so when I got her a new cage, her old cage was green, her new cage was red. I didn't think about this, but I put them next to each other and I would see her. You go over to the new cage and, you know, play with her toys and eat and then go back to her old cage. Well, that went on for two months and I figured, okay, we had enough of this. Now you're just messing with me. So, you know, I, I moved the little green cage and she had no problem going in the red cage. So I didn't pick up on her cues that she was ready to go in, but that's that's how I've introduced so okay 
All right, and then I have a question from Joel. Um, he asks, hi, Ozzy is 18 and we've had him since he was about one. He has only uh, one really aggravating behavior. When he's unhappy about something, for example, if I leave the room, he'll make an extremely loud and penetrating squeak. Is It's really blood curling, um, curdling, any advice? Yeah, that's kind of typical. So what I want you to do before you leave the room is I want you to tell him what you're doing and where you're going. Okay, you say, Ozzy, I'm gonna be right back. I have to go here. Now, it sounds, a lot of people like, I don't wanna to talk to my bird like that, but talk to him like you would a child, okay? If you left a child in the room and you just walked out, the kid would be doing the same thing. So you would always say, you know, I'm, I'm going, I'll be right back. And as you leave, make a contact call. As he screams, say something that you're not gonna mind hearing for the next 20 years. So whether it's his name or whether it's part of the song, just kind of talk back to him. Uh, in the wild, birds are not left alone. They're always in a group because if they're left alone, that means there's somebody's dinner or lunch. So even though they're in our house, that's still instinctual. That's how they survive. And we're not going to get that out of them. So just try to make a pleasant noise back to them. And then when you go in, you can always reward them for good behavior. Good boy and good girl go a tremendous way with African greys over treats. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so then I have a question from Jazz. Uh, Jazz asks, my gray loves head scratches, but has started to rub himself on me. Is this a behavior I should praise or is this promoting hormonal behavior? Um, what's he rubbing, his head or his butt? Oh, it does not say. <laughs> yes, that's... <laughs> that's if it if it's his head rubbing his beak rubbing that's probably just because he's enjoying it um i wouldn't do as much you know scratching maybe just stay around his ears because they do love that um if he's if he's rubbing his butt that is hormonal <laughs> um and you kind of want to move him to another spot i don't necessarily put my guys in the cage when they do something like that i'll just take them off me i'll put them on the arm of the chair they're still right with me you know, I'll give them something else to do, you know, talk to them or, you know, play a little game or do something like that to try to deter that. But it really depends on what's being rubbed. Okay. Uh, okay. And you probably don't want to like scratch under the wings and down yeah. the back. <laughs> it was kind no, of that's, what a mate, that's what a mate would do. Okay. Uh, okay. So then, I, um, let's see. Um, okay. My two grays are attacking each other when they are out in the same place. Is there anything I can do to help them get, um, get on or, is what I consider attacking in, in reality a form of, of Congo African gray flirting? Um, well, if they are attacking each other, I would definitely keep them separated. That's the reason I have five of everything because nobody wants to share. The girls uh, are a little bit nicer to each other, but I cannot have the boys within length of each other. Now, Sydney, again, who has the ADHD and separation anxiety, he will actually fly to attack the other birds. So I have to keep him with a baby clip. I don't want to, because all my other guys are fully flighted, but it's a safety risk. And the last time that happened, it got really bad, because he landed on, he flew and landed on Sterling's back and they both landed on the floor. And believe me, they can fight like a dog fight. So, um, that was not a good thing. And I had blood all over the walls, the ceiling and everything else. So it's important to keep them apart because if they're interested in mating, there's gonna be a little jostling, but not vicious. Okay, wow. Um, so then I have a question from Tandy. Um, she asked, my um, Timna African Gray is um, agoraphobic when I take him outside in his travel cage for some sun. He opens his wings and shivers. He needs the sun. Um, so is there anything that, uh, let's see, that's, I, I mean, are there signs that, that a bird is, you know, being happy and relaxed outside versus being stressed by being outside or? Well, I think at first they're probably all going to be a little stressed being out there because it's not, it's not, what they're used to, okay? Everything's brighter, there's squirrels running, butterflies going, birds, everything else. So um, what you need to do is kind of desensitize them. And even if you just say, go outside your door a couple feet and maybe plant right there. So if you could see that he's getting nervous, you guys go back in. Um, you could do it a little bit at a time, say versus just going out and sitting out on the porch. 
Um, when they're really nervous, both Congos and Timnas will actually chew on their toenails. So um, they'll chew on their toenails, they'll stick their toenail in, and they'll pull their lower beak down. Um, that's a sign of extreme stress. Now, normally in the wild, they'd fly away. That's how they get away from stress, but they can't with us. So start with little steps just outside the door, watch behavior. If he relax, maybe the next day go out another foot. Next day, maybe go another foot. If you see him acting nervous, step back a foot. Okay. And take uh, some favorite treats out there and give him some treats. Nice. Um, and maybe I, I've always used the outside time as, as an opportunity maybe for a spray bath if they, it, it, the sun seems to, they, they seem to gravitate um, towards that. I don't know if with, with grays, but with Amazons and my Conure, it was the, 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 the thing. I had one Amazon that would only take a shower outside in the rain. So I was always outside when it was raining with her. So she would take a bath. So. <laughs> Hopefully it's a, depending on the, the weather in your area. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. All right. So I have a question from Karen. Um, says, I see you have um, Sam on your shoulder. Everything I have read says this could be dangerous to the human. Is there a way to safely train my gray to sit on my shoulder? Well, I agree. Um, I agree it can be a safety issue. And you'll hear me say all the time, this is not the spot that they belong, okay? The reason Sam is here, and if you could see, I haven't really moved my one hand or arm. I got it placed, it's going numb. I got it placed on the bed. So she isn't slipping, all right? Now, if a bird's up there um, and it goes to fall, your instinct, as you've seen me do a couple times, is go like this. See what she did? She just grabbed me. She didn't put any pressure on there, okay? She does it all the time. Thank you. Good girl. Um, so if she's falling, okay, if I'm up moving around and doing that and, and she slips and I go like that, I'm going to get bit real bad, okay? She's going to fall. I'm going to bleed. She's going to be associating me with her fall and getting hurt, okay? I'm going to lose trust in her. I'm never going to want her up there again. So the only reason I have her here on my shoulder right now is because in case I needed a bird to do some, an example with. Otherwise, they're on the trees. Um, they're not on my shoulder. They're on the arm of the couch. They're on the back of the couch. You know, I don't want them. I don't want them falling. I don't want to break trust. Okay. Right. And, and she gave you a good example. Or he gave you a good example right there. With the, with the, mm -hmm. Right on cue. <laughs> so, um, so then I have a question. Um, okay, here we go. I'm a licensed uh, veterinary, veterinary technician. I've had my Timna Gray since he was 11 weeks old. I used to bring him with me to work a few times a week, would take him to stores, et cetera, as a baby to help desensitize him and socialize him. He's still very fearful, but rarely aggressive. Even a neighbor walking by the window causes him to panic and jump off the cage. Any advice to help make him less panicked? Um, well, the neighbor walking by, um, that's, that's kind of normal because again, the bird would fly away in the wild. It's, it's startled, just like we would jump if we saw something. Um, I would keep it up with going out if, if you can. I've been known to take my guys out in their stroller and go into stores and Home Depot and anywhere they would let me. Um, and you know, that, that's a good way to do it. But if there's something that's unannounced or, you know, it, that's just natural for them to react that way. Um, unfortunately, unless you talk to your neighbor and they give you some kind of sign or signal, you know, that they're going to be out there, but that's not really the way it goes. Um, I can tell you with my guys, the whole back of the room is windows. I can tell you when something flies by there because they all get startled. So it's, that's what they do. Okay. Right. So then I have a, let's see. Oh, uh, this is a good question. Um, can you touch on blood tears? Um, Seen uh, seen when the bird is stressed. I have seen this uh, once during a vet beak trim. Yes, I'm very thankful. I've never seen it. Um, I am a, probably um, a very good client and a very bad client. Uh, my vets can tell you um, because I'm very hands on. Um, I believe it's when they get so stressed they can cry clear tears, which I have seen and they can cry 
blood tears. I'm not exactly sure if it's the blood pressure going up. Um, I'm not sure what causes them to turn to blood. But when I first got Sydney and I took him for his well bird visit, um, he, they were holding him and his, he cried tears just as big as his eyeballs. And then I started to cry um, because one of my birds had just passed away and that's why we got Sydney. So, um, and that's the one and only time. Um, he was also very stressed with every other thing with huffing and puffing and his white blood cell count came back really super high. So it was all very stressed um, for him to be there. So he has white coat syndrome. White coat. <laughs> That's a good one. All right. Um, let's see. I think we have time hopefully for a couple more questions. Um, uh, let's see here what comes up. We do have a lot. I mean, a lot of people definitely um, want to pick your brain on their, uh, about their grays. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see time for one or two more, if you don't mind. How Sam oh. did. Hi, you being good girl. Okay, so we talked about the blood tears. Um, I got, I got you. Yes, I do. And as I was saying before, um, Sam is, uh, she was a girlfriend of mine um, that, and the owner passed away and I took Sam in four years ago or three years ago. And you can tell an African gray, an older African gray that you take in, just how much it's been through in its life by the way it wants to work with you. I can take no credit for how sweet and good this bird is. Um, not at all. She was very loved. You know if a bird comes in your house and is swearing, you know what kind of environment it came from. Um, I know we all swear and carry on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm originally from New Jersey, so sometimes I have to watch what I say. Um, and I'm very lucky my guys haven't picked anything up because if they have bad vocabularies and stuff like that, it's very hard to place them. Very hard to keep that in mind. Yeah, very good point. Um, okay, so I have one last question um, from Evelyn. And if we didn't get your question today, we will uh, we will send you a reply with it with an answer. Okay. Um, so Evelyn asks, with the plucking being potentially genetic, um, is there any cases of plucking of in the wild? Any cases of grains we, plucking in the wild? We haven't been able to really do too much study of them in the wild. I've heard conflicting things. Um, I've heard, yes, they, they, they're they pluck in the wild, and then some people will say that that's because they were sick. Um, other people have said they haven't seen any, but because the, the area that they're in is so volatile, we can't really get in that much to observe them. Um, we can only go by the few people that have been there in the past to tell us what they've seen, and yes, they've said that they've seen it in the wild. Okay. Wow. Um, well, I think we, we covered, you covered so much today, Lisa. I really appreciate it. And I know that our viewers have as well. I just, from the questions and the comments and it was just an overall, like just well-rounded, like, thank you. That was You're very welcome. informative. Um, and and if, sorry. If everybody, um, if, if somebody sees something that they want covered or something, a topic more in depth, if, you know, they want to do another webinar or whatever, just, you know, let them know, let, let, let Laura know, and we'll, we'll run with it. Okay. And, and Lisa, Lisa uh, just let everyone know, I know Lisa also contributes a blog to lefebvre.com. So um, she's got some great articles up there uh, to check out. Um, and so just real quick, so coming up, we have, we have a couple uh, um, great webinars coming up uh, a week. We have one next Friday with Dr. Stephanie Lamb. And she is going to give us, let's see, the topic is going to be fun, fun with foraging, how to get started, and fun toy ideas. So um, a great topic, and hopefully we'll learn some new tips and tricks to keeping our birds happily busy. And, okay, Lisa, so on Sunday, we have a very, very, very special webinar that you're going to be hosting with Dr. Irene Pepperberg. Um, and that's going to actually be a fundraising one for the Alex Foundation. So um, that'll be on Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. It's the um, 16th, Sunday the 16th. Sunday is August 16th, yes. Um, so uh, what, it'll be um, uh, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 4 p.m. Eastern time. 
and that is going to be a fundraising uh, webinar um, and we'll have that information uh, check liftfever.com we'll have something up and um, that one is going to be you know you're going to you get to spend more time you can spend time with Irene online so um, yes. it's a good one to sign up for and you're also going to help raise money for the Alex Foundation so yes 100% of the proceeds is going to the Alex Foundation and it's going to be in the lab and you're going to be able to see um, Griffin and Athena work with Irene and uh, take some question, live questions. Oh, you want your Apple now? Oh, gosh. I know somebody I saw down there, somebody asked me, how do I know with you of what she wants? She, she's talking in my ear. She's telling me water. She's telling me Apple. I tried giving her a cashew. She didn't want it. So <laughs> that's great. Um, all right. So uh, I guess that's all we have time for today. That went by super fast. Um, so and, Make sure, check out our webinars. We've got two really great ones coming up uh, the, uh, coming up next weekend. And um, today's was great. I mean, very good. Thank you. And uh, thank you. so thank you, Lisa. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we we'll hope to see you back soon. And uh, in the meantime, stay healthy, stay safe, and all the best to you and your flock. Bye. Bye.